Hello, everybody. I'm Lissy Medvedow, Executive Director of the Rappaport Center for Law and Public Policy at Boston College Law School. Thank you for joining us today for our program, COVID-19, Public Health, the Government Response, colon, the Massachusetts Perspective. We are very, very fortunate to have three extraordinary members of various constituencies. Michael Caljo from Blue Cross Blue Shield, Massachusetts, Senator Cindy Friedman, and Commissioner Gary Anderson of the Commission, the Division of Insurance. I am going to introduce just Michael Caljo, which gives me great pleasure, and then he will introduce the other two. Michael Caljo is Vice President of Public Government and Regulatory Affairs for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts. He's been there since May of 2008, and he directs the company's activities in myriad policy, legislative, and regulatory issues. Before that, he was in the private sector for a bid at Holland and Knight. And prior to that, he spent 10 years, a decade in government, where he was the Deputy Director General Counsel and Chief of Staff for the Massachusetts Office of Consumer Affairs and Business Regulation. He served as the General Counsel to the Massachusetts Division of Insurance as well. And in the state legislature, he was Chief of Staff and General Counsel to the Massachusetts Senate Minority Leader. He's taught at Suffolk Law School, at BU Law School. He's a graduate of Boston Latin School, Williams College, and Suffolk University Law School. And most importantly, and nearest and dearest to my heart, he is, I believe, the longest standing member of the Rappaport Center Advisory Board. And for that, I'm very grateful. Mike has done many programs with us over these years. And I'm turning it over to you now. Thank you for everything you do for us. Well, Lizzie, thank you for that uh, tremendous introduction, which really only proves a couple of things, one of which is I'm old. <laughs> um, I really appreciate the efforts of the Rappaport Center to uh, put this program together in your personal efforts and Cindy's personal efforts in, in leading us uh, towards today's events. I wish we weren't here. I think COVID-19 has just been such a life-altering set of issues economically, racially, um, and obviously in terms of the health impacts across the Commonwealth, across America, and across the world that um, I really truly wish we weren't here today. Uh, but since we are here, um, we thought it was a really important time to discuss uh, a lot of the work that Massachusetts has been leading on the efforts. I do think that we are in a very good place as a Commonwealth in terms of our response to the pandemic. And really uh, that response uh, being so well stewarded is thanks to the two people who are on my panel today. I'll first start uh, to in introduce State Senator Cindy Friedman. Uh, Cindy Friedman was elected to the Massachusetts Senate in July of 2017. She represents the 4th Middlesex District, uh, which is Arlington, Bill Ricker, Burlington, Woburn, and some parts of Lexington, the lucky parts of Lexington. Uh, prior to becoming a state senator, uh, she worked as a public school teacher and executive in the high tech field and later served uh, nearly a decade as I did for chief of staff to a state senator, Senator uh, legend, state senator Ken Donnelly. During her time, she shaped uh, policy for Senator uh, Donnelly and really did a lot to work, particularly on the opioid crisis, both in that incarnation and then later as state senator. She has been a real leader on COVID-19 policy. There isn't a week or really days that go by where I don't hear from her with a question, a concern, a suggestion, an improvement that we can take on as a healthcare uh, sector together collaboratively, and she's a real leader. Um, I'm also pleased to be joined by Commissioner Gary Anderson, who was appointed commissioner of the Massachusetts Division of Insurance by Governor Baker in October of 2017. Commissioner Anderson joined the Division of Insurance, or frequently I'll, I'll tend to call it the DOI. So just in terms of code, DOI means Division of Insurance for our listeners as its first deputy commissioner in February of, of 2014. 
His responsibilities then involved all aspects of strategic planning and policy development for the agency. Prior to that time, he uh, was a uh, chief of staff uh, policy advisor and senior counsel to the Massachusetts State Senate President's Office, and again, uh, involved in any number of policy areas, and prior to that time, worked as general counsel to the Financial Services Committee, where he handled legislation related to insurance and banking. Uh, he previously had worked in the insurance field with a regional carrier in the late 90s in Northwestern United States. Again, um, Commissioner Anderson's background and experience is exactly the leadership that we need for the current times. And again, he has been quite active and engaged. The Division of Insurance has issued, I think, over 20, at my, my last count, over 23 specific COVID-19 uh, rules and regulations and guidances to the industry in response to that. And both of them are, are tremendous allies in our joint and truly collaborative efforts to help protect Massachusetts members. Uh, with that, I think we'll get right into some of the work here. And, and I, could I, could I, I'm so sorry to interrupt sure. before you jump in. I neglected to say the program is being recorded and we will be engaged in conversation for approximately an hour, after which we'll take questions from those attending. If you would put those questions in the Q&A, I would appreciate it. Great. Thank you, Lissy. Um, so I thought we'd just start this off um, in terms of maybe a recap for, for folks that are tuning in. Massachusetts government took on a number of uh, really immediate steps to ensure that residents had access to the care that they needed uh, and that they'd be paid for um, at the beginning of the pandemic, really in March. And in addition to talking a little bit about that, maybe I'll start with um, Chair Friedman in that regard. Um, can you outline what that timeline looked like? <laughs> how, you, know, you know, almost from a personal setting, how did you orient yourself and your team in the Senate towards the new challenges, uh, particularly working in a new environment, which was all remote at that time? And how did you, uh, Chair Friedman, sort of just figure out what made sense? You know, how did you sift through all the different in emerging questions that were coming at us, you know, hour by hour. Wow, <laughs> that wasn't on my list of questions. Um, that's a really interesting question. I, I think so. One of the things that um, I think was very helpful in the beginning was the relationship uh, that we had with with mem certain members of the healthcare community. So having that relationship, being able to call you, Mike, and saying, what are you hearing? Um, I, remember, I remember the first kind of conversations, I think were in February, um, and, and, and other folks, you know, doctors and, you know, uh, providers that we, um, and insurers that we'd been working with, um, seeing, uh, having those conversations and having those relationships were really good because, you know, our, my way of going about things is to say, there's a problem. There's an immediate response. There's a midterm response. There's a long-term response. What do we need to do right now? And so I'm having been involved in telehealth scope of practice, um, uh, uh, rate parities, that those kinds of issues allowed us to say, hey, something's coming, what should we be doing? And, and to, to start to look at things in the short term, in the medium term, in the long term. So I think that's how we actually did, um, how we started to address this. I remember having a very early on conversation with the Senate president about telehealth and saying, you know, I think telehealth is going to be really important. Maybe we should push our telehealth bill. And, um, and then having close, close contact with not only the providers and, and um, later with you, Gary, um, that was started to be an ongoing conversation, but also with the administration. So having some understanding of the context and having those relationships was really, really key. 
Gary, from your perspective, particularly as an employer with staff issues, um, how did you reconcile those you know, day-to-day -day issues with the urgency of the actions that were needed uh, just from a, a, a personal perspective on managing staff before we get into the policy issues, there must have been a challenge just getting people oriented to the new order. Yeah, sure, Mike. Um, yeah, I mean, I, first I would echo probably a lot of what um, the Senator has, has said. Um, and I, for, I, maybe I should back, back up just a bit to thank um, Lissy and Cindy um, at the Rapport Center for, for organizing this for us, for Mike, for your outreach. Um, I, I, I agree with you, it's a pleasure to do this. It's, rather not be doing um, this, uh, you know, in light of everything that's going on. But I, uh, I appreciate you gathering us together and the Senator, the Senator who has been, uh, like you said, Mike, from the very beginning, um, inquisitive. And, you know, her, her portfolio spans the spectrum of issues that she has to deal with, while mine is uh, relatively narrow in the insurance landscape. Um, and so her, her outreach to us has been uh, really important, I think, for us, the division, to, to be able to discuss these issues, to have a frank conversation about, um, you know, the way that telehealth is going to work right now. Um, what do we do in the future? How do we maintain it? Things like that. Um, so thank you to the Senator. Thank you to you, Mike. It, it's, and we'll talk about this throughout. It will probably be, a, I think, a recurring theme throughout our discussion about um, the collaborative effort. I think I would have a hard time working for a boss, a governor that didn't think I have a philosophy like I have, which is to, um, much like the senator said, we have an issue, we have a problem. Um, let's get everybody around and talk about how to address it. So um, you're right, the logistics, um, the policy and the approach aside, the logistics of trying to um, make sure that we have a staff of about 125 here at the Division of Assurance. Um, <clears throat> and we were not necessarily built <laughs> for remote functionality. Um, you, you could juxtapose us to like a banks who because was already, you know, Division of Banks was already kind of built for that. So it meant, you know, getting everybody a laptop that didn't have one or a, a smartphone that didn't have one. Um, so there was a lot of quick work done by a lot of folks here. Um, my assistant, Stephanie Pinion, who has been incredible throughout. I mean, there are some real champions during this and people like uh, Stephanie, she's one of them where you, it is every single day making sure, and you're not, she's not always making friends <laughs> because she's telling people to stay away. You can't come in, um, stay at home. Uh, we'll get you what you need, whether we have to mail it to you or find some other way to deliver it to you. So it was a, a huge logistical challenge, I think, that we had to confront. And, you know, we also house here at the Division of Insurance is something uh, you'd only know about if you got in a car accident, which is the Board of Appeal. Um, and if it, you're determined to be at more than 50% at fault, then uh, your, insur your insurance company may surcharge you, right? So um, lift your premium um, and you have the right to appeal that. Uh, here at the Division of Assurance at the Board of Appeal. Uh, we, we conduct about 30,000 of those every single year. So what do you do when, you know, the locations where they handle those appeals are closed, like courthouses? Um, so it was transitioning all of that while making sure that the consumer um, is served, right? So that they're still able to challenge um, that surcharge. So it was a huge, huge effort. I, very appreciative of the folks that I work with that um, we were able to kind of work our way through through that challenge so that we can address um, the major policy issues that we're confronted with. <clears throat> so I want to I want to move this into a care delivery conversation, um, and I know that as Blue Cross um, began to work remotely, we created a dedicated team of senior level folks that were uh, focused only on COVID-19 issues of care and access. Um, and to that end, we worked on uh, improvements for telehealth. What did it mean to make sure that people could get care by telephone or by video? How did we do this you know, in a really involved way? 
um, and then also around some of the cost share waiver uh, savings that we wanted to put in place to make sure people got the care that they needed. Um, but let, let's talk a little bit about that. How do, you know, to, to wind the tape back again, and let's, before we go forward, let's go back to March where we were pretty close to lockdown, right? We wanted to make sure people stayed home um, as much as they could to be safe, to stop the spread of the infection. And yet we also wanted at the same time to make sure that folks that urgently needed care, acute care for COVID-19 or otherwise, were able to get that care. And maybe I'll start you with you, Gary. How, how did you come to terms with that in terms of the line drawing that you saw that were important? And how did you make sure that that happened? Sure. Um, yeah, March seems like a decade ago. <laughs> um, uh, and you're right. The administration, the Division of Insurance, took a number of steps um, <clears throat> you know, to, to stop the spread um, and to have necessary treatment available. Um, I, I would highlight a few of those. You've said it, uh, we'll probably talk about it repeatedly, is telehealth services. That, that enabled hundreds of thousands of appointments uh, for, for insurers with their providers, um, despite the emergency circumstances. So uh, it was also important that we have diagnostic testing um, covered and available across the state. That was uh, in large part of the efforts, or collaborative efforts with the carriers, right? And you mentioned uh, waiving <clears throat> the cost sharing. Um, uh, so we, we've continued to work on a number of uh, bulletins. Mike, you'd mentioned that we've issued approximately 23, 24 uh, pandemic related bulletins in a typical year for context for those that are unaware with the work we do, which is probably good that they're unaware of the work we do. We're happy to stay in the background. Um, but we usually issue about 10 bulletins in a year. Um, we're up to, like you said, about 23 or 24 of them. And a number of them were to provide guidance to the carriers in the market on streamlining, right? Utilization review, um, administrative processes, right? Uh, during the crisis. I mean, the goal was there so that you're limiting the administrative requirements um, so that physicians, hospitals uh, could focus on patient care, improving patients' access to care, uh, we've been referring to those, these as our administrative simplification bulletin. Uh, some of the contents were uh, originally set to sunset at the end of June, but we issued another bulletin um, to ease the further ease that and provide flexibility through the end of September. Um, and we're in discussions now about, uh, you know, do we need to extend that potentially further to relax kind of prior authorization, given uncertainty for, for the provider community? Um, so it was our hope that um, as a result of the flexibilities that were provided that physicians, hospitals, uh, other healthcare providers would be able to more easily meet um, the demand, right? The demand that uh, presented by COVID and quickly and efficiently care for patients. Um, we could probably go on, maybe I'll stop there and-, and um, Yeah, I, I think that's a good inflection point, Cindy, for, for you to jump in and talk about the legislative priorities and then maybe springboard a little bit into some of your earlier comments around telehealth, uh, because I do think we're poised for even greater improvements of care through the work of the Senate and the legislature overall around telehealth. Um, sure, I mean, I think ours was a little different because we weren't part of the, you know, we weren't uh, in a position to, to um, release requirements. We weren't, you know, ours was, I think in the beginning, much more of a uh, oversight role over what is, you know, what is going on, what needs to go on. I think we spent a lot of time passing information back and forth among people, um, you know, like with, with you, with the insurers and with, with um, the command center. I mean, I think having the command center was just critical. This, the, just to have a central not only a central place, but a single person. And, you know, Mary Lou Sutter is, is both a bulldog and a rock star. And I wouldn't wish that job on anyone, but that was so critical um, because there was a place where we could at least um, centralize information 
and and feel like we were getting information back and forth. And, 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 the, and the way she approached that job made it work, right? Absolutely. The responsibility where the buck wasn't passed to anyone else. Exactly. Yeah. Right. It was absolutely, this is our job, we are on it, um, and, and it is our responsibility. And, you know, there was never, there was never a moment. Um, you know, if we ever, if anyone whether ever wants to question whether leadership is important, yes. just take a look at this, okay? Absolutely. Um, so I think that, um, you know, so that's what we were doing, I think, more with the legislature was making sure that information was getting passed, that issues were being addressed, that we knew um, that, that were coming to us, and there were many in, you know, thousands. So um, I think that was kind of our initial way of, of looking at this. Um, we did do a lot of preparation. You know, we had the telehealth bill, we had a scope of practice bill. We did, you know, we had lots of things in place so that if it was necessary, we could, um, you know, we could weigh in in ways that we thought were important. Um, and, I, and I guess I'll just add to it, just in terms of the revolution in care that's happened, we have seen an explosion in telehealth care visits just as a practical matter since March, um, where during the height of the pandemic, about 80 to 90% of all care was telehealth related. And it provided a very important uh, life preserver, life raft for folks who were stuck at home, uh, wanted to access services, particularly in the behavioral health area, which we, we had expected were going to go up and have gone way up in terms of need, but also played a role in terms of uh, addressing other care needs that aren't, weren't being addressed because people weren't able to see their doctor live. And it's not a panacea, you know, it's, it's not certainly going to be the answer in every situation. You and I have talked about, for example, some behavioral health settings where it's not appropriate for the visit to be only virtual, that there needs to be that face-to-face -face contact. But I did want to pause there and get your thoughts about the importance of what happened you know, what happened in terms of the care delivery that people got the benefit of? So I think that was, there, there are two pieces I think that came out of telehealth. One was that it allowed healthcare to continue, which is paramount, right? right. The other piece of it that I think is really important, and unfortunately this is what pandemics tend to do or crises, is we took a step that some of us have been trying to take for a very long time and we just did it. We just turned on telehealth. And what that has also allowed us to do is actually look at the system and say, okay, here it is in all its glory. What works? What doesn't work? What should we be focused on? How do we continue to do the best of telehealth um, and yet control it in a way so that it works for patient care? And I think that's been really invaluable. I mean, you bring up behavioral health, it's been huge. It has been, you know, just, there's general agreement among all of us, often rare, that behavioral health has to be covered. Um, but we also know that we're starting to see that for kids, it doesn't work quite as well. The kids, you know, we need to keep doing telehealth, but we can now see, okay, here's how telehealth may not work for certain groups. And so we've now got to focus on making sure that they get their care. So I think that's been really important. And we need to, like so many of the activities that have taken place over the course of the six months, we need to look at what we've learned. It, um, the, the, uh, that's a great point. And, and I'd even stress another class of folks that the assumption was that they wouldn't tackle telehealth ably, you know, generationally, we saw I think, uh, seniors using telehealth groves, you know, in much higher numbers than sort of the presumption was going into this. So on the front end, you know, kids, kids, it, it may not be as appropriate for every child setting or behavioral health setting, but it's a much more adaptable program and seniors use the technology much faster than we had expected to happen. 
Yeah. Mike, what do you, I'm, I'm curious, do you, off the top of your head, do you know the, um, because, you know, we know, we know it's been a bit since I've seen uh, some of the numbers on it, but uh, where you guys are on telehealth, because the exponential growth <laughs> has been, um, uh, it's been impressive. What, what are you guys at? Yeah, we're, we're still seeing significant growth. Um, if we do the year over year comparison, to our telehealth visits to a year ago, we're at now at about 50% growth compared to last year. And now we're net with within office visits and telehealth at a higher level year over year to last year at this time. So if you add up telehealth plus in office, we're at sort of 120% of capacity compared to September, August, September of last year. And some of that might be pent up demand right, from folks not getting services before. But there was a time when that telehealth, non-telehealth or in-office visit comparison was 80% telehealth, 20% in-office. And now it's, it's um, kind of flipped where telehealth is the minority of visits and in-office is definitely ramped back up. People are feeling safe to go back into the doctor. The safety protocols that small offices have put in place or larger systems have put in place have worked. And I think folks are starting to feel less afraid to interact with their provider in that way, which is a good thing. And it, and it says that those protocols are working. We would not have been there if we didn't have telehealth, right? Because those offices needed, first of all, to keep their people at home right away and build out those safety protocols, whether it's sanitizing or wait times or all, all visit, no, no drop-in visits, for example, all appointment only, uh, you know, all of those protocols had to be built in place. And now we're there and we're seeing it not revert completely, but go back to an in-office setting. Um, and with the background of telehealth, we know that if there's a second surge, and we should talk about that, if there's a second surge, we can uh, rest assured that telehealth will provide a backstop uh, in that in that instance. But it's a great question, Gary. And, I, and to, to the Senator's point, we've now got, so we issued the, the DOI bulletin that followed the governor's uh, order, right? We issued that in mid-March. So we've now got, I mean, almost exactly, right? Um, six months of data yeah. on what, what will work, what won't, won't for, um, the development for policymakers like the senator to, to make decisions on um, how best to do it. Because like the senator said, well, it was 224, right? Chapter 224 in 2012 with some focus on, on telehealth. And that was, like the senator said, um, eight years ago. Uh, I mean, so it's, it's, it's sort of like a forced pilot, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's unfortunate that it's taken this. Yeah. But if there are, this is one of those... Um, there's not silver linings here, but one of those policy measures that's really, uh, we've been able to, to pilot, like you said. So the, the other thing that I wanna draw out um, is the CAUSHA waiver issue, which is that folks that have COVID-19 symptoms or diagnoses uh, don't have to pay for their care, right? There's a complete protection from any out-of-pocket cost from a consumer, not just for the hospitalization, but even the doctor visit, the test, you know, and it's a really important public health um, tool to make sure that folks uh, don't stint on care. If there's any doubt at all, they should go in and see their doctor or, you know, call, call their doctor, obviously, or, or go see their hospital, local hospital to get the care that they need. And, and combined with that was the, the testing protocols that you developed, Gary, in terms of the mechanisms to make sure people get tested for COVID, they don't have to worry about it. Can you give us a little bit of an update on where we are on testing in terms of uh, community? And we've seen the numbers in Massachusetts continue to be really strong, especially in comparison to other places. And do you think that's made a difference in terms of infection rate in Massachusetts's relative success? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I can't say for sure, but I would, I would like to think so, right? I mean, that was a really important, and that's early on the, in this process as well, is, um, you know, when you're, look, I, I would say there is so much uncertainty, and there's been so much uncertainty during this, 
that um, not knowing what's next, even now as we go into fall, do we head into, you know, we, I hope that we're able to um, bypass a second surge, right? Um, but there's just so much uncertainty and I would, and maybe this is kind of the rel why that's relevant to the place like Division of Insurance is that um, we're the one entity that's responsible for the financial solvency of, of the insurance companies, not just health, of course, but insurance companies uh, across all lines uh, that we roughly, you know, there are 1600 or so insurance companies that are operated in Massachusetts. Um, that's, you know, spans all lines, about 80 of those are domestic, right? So they're essentially kind of short uh, for headquartered here. Um, and we have a, you know, very healthy um, health insurance marketplace, um, you know, as, as I meet with commissioners across the United States and the territories, it's, we're very fortunate that we have a number of carriers participating in our market. That's not true of every state. And so that is in large part because of, you know, we'll talk about this probably throughout, but the policy measures that have been developed over years and years that foster that kind of um, competition and growth, um, that the competition that is hopefully better for the consumer. But to back up to your point, Mike, I, I do, um, you know, part of that, and, it, and it's ongoing, it, part of the concern is that, uh, all right, if you waive all the cost sharing, right, it's kind of the, the, the intersection of public health a little bit and insurance, right, it's probably the best thing to do because we need people to, to be treated, uh, tested, um, and all right, so the other side of that, how will that impact the carrier's finances? Um, that was a really different, I mean, you know, as you know, looking back, it's now hard to remember <laughs> what we were going through at that time, but as the center also noted with the command center, you know, these late nights where you're, you're going through, what, all right, division of insurance, what does that mean if we do X, Y, and Z and require it, what does it mean for the insurance companies, right? And at times with some, of the, with some of the things that we did, we had to have a little bit of a safety valve just in case, right? Not all insurance companies are created equal. Um, so some are doing better than others, um, but we have, you know, all healthy, but some are doing better than others. Um, so it was really a challenge, I think, to, f you know, I, again, I, it's hard to envision not being able to do that with having the, these very honest conversations with the carriers, with people like you, Mike, with um, the people at the other carriers, right? Look, this is what we're, we need to do, right? We've got to solve this issue. We got to, the treatment issue, uh, the testing issue. So um, we've got to figure out a way to, to do this. And so it was, I think, one of the very early challenges, but the right, um, you know, with a lot of people as part so of that conversation, the what, right. What would be the biggest disappointment? I'll, I guess I'll start with Cindy on this. What over the past six months has disappointed you most about? the governmental response um, or the stakeholder response to COVID-19, things that keep you up at night. Uh, you know, there's a big list. <laughs> I, I, I've got a big list um, as well, uh, but uh, what what has bothered you in terms of the response and where's there a gap, Cindy? Oh gosh. Uh, um... Well, the only way I can answer this question is I'm not, I mean, I'm certainly disappointed in the behavior of, of certain entities and individuals, okay? Um, but I'm, it's not disappointment, it's, it's more of a, this is a gap that is so big that I'm not totally sure how to deal with this. So. Right. Those, first of all, the testing is just, it's, I mean, it's not from lack of people trying, but it ain't going to get us out of this at the rate we're going because we can't test, we can't test our way out of this with the tests that we have. Yeah. We can test our way out of it with different kinds of tests, but we can't do it with the tests that we have. It's I guess where, where I'm going in my mind is, limitations that the Trump administration has placed upon themselves. Well, it, that, that's, that's my other 
Okay, yeah. so my other piece of it is we can't cut our way out of this or pay our way out of it. If we don't have the federal government involved in this, no insurance company is going to be solvent. Nobody's going to, you know, the economy is going to go to pieces. And we're going to have a state budget that we're going to have to cut. And that's just going to exacerbate every problem that we have today. So those two things are huge. And then the third piece is we, I don't think, were really struck in the face, hit upside the head with how integrated all of our systems are and need to be. So you pull one piece out of that and everything starts to crumble. You know what we've, two big, my two biggest learnings in this? Schools feed children and employers pay for health. Oh, look, you've lost your employment. Where's your health care? Oh, your children don't go to school. There goes breakfast and lunch. I mean, that, that, those two things in and of itself, if that hasn't taught us something, if we don't wake up and try and figure out how we better share the responsibility of some very fundamental things like food and healthcare and housing, we do not have a stable, um, we don't have a stable community, state, country or anything. And so that's what I think we have to really, really get our heads down and focus on how we're going to close some of these gaps. And that's what keeps me up at night. And it just keeps, the longer we go on, the, the, the more we see this, right? What, what's the latest on vaccine development and deployment and government's role there in terms of next steps? You know, we're we're all anxious and hopeful for a vaccine at some point, uh, likely next year, it seems. If you yeah, so um, <laughs> this is my own personal, um, my personal view on it, okay, uh, and what I'm seeing. Um, you, you notice that a couple of the big players are, have pulled back, so AstraZeneca, um, Moderno can't get, um, can't enroll enough minorities in, so they've slowed down. Pfizer's still saying they might have something by the end of October. Um, but I really think it's going to be quite a while. Um, look, even if, even if Pfizer came out with the vaccine, came out their trials at the end of October, and they said we're going to have something by the end of the year, I would be very surprised if people were comfortable with that, okay? Honestly, if there is an, an executive use um, authorization, there's going to have to be a lot of data that goes with that so that the medical community says, yeah, we're, we're comfortable with how you got to these decisions. So I think we're really, um, there's a lot of um, work being done. Go to the New York Times vaccine tracker. It's got everybody in the world who's doing anything. But I really don't think we are going to be there very anytime soon. Um, I think our biggest uh, right now, I think the most um, interesting developments are in these very rapid tests that you can take at home and that in the public health sphere, don't test whether or not you have uh, copies of the virus they test how infectious you are. Mm -hmm. And that I think is the, um, is what we need to start doing so that people can start moving around, okay? Because whether or not you have some copies of the virus in your system, which is what these um, PCR tests and antigen tests tell us, right? They say, yes, you have, you ha yes, you have COVID, but they don't tell you maybe you had it 12 weeks ago. Maybe you yeah, it's a, yeah. it's a difference between a toggle switch up or down. Yeah. There's a, a switch that you can monitor the price. Exactly. And if you're in the hospital and you're sick, they really need to know whether you have, it's a diagnostic test. What we need is, Gary, are you infectious? Like if you go out tomorrow, do you have enough of this virus in your system that you will be a spreader? That is going to what's going to allow us to sort of maintain some level of, um, you know, of, of movement 
that people can then, then we can start to get kids back to school, people back to work, restaurants open. And that's and what, really- And what is, what's the role of government in tracking adherence? It's, it's a hard question. It's a really hard question. Um, because, you know, who tracks this? Is there a registry? Do we want to have one? Is it no, a privacy no. concern? What, what's the right monitoring of that issue? I think the monitoring of the issue, and again, it's, it, 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 there's no good decisions here. Just everybody should understand that. These, there's, there's the best bad decisions and the worst bad decisions. But this is all, there's nothing like fabulous about this. But I think if you can take a, a test every day, if you could just do a swab and put it in a solution and you can show that you did it or you go into work and you take a test and they look at it and they say, okay, you're good, go in. I think that's the kind of surveillance that we need to do. That's the kind of, kind of, um, of um, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the word you use, but um, a protocol or protocol yep. that we would need to have because then you're really it's in the moment it's for a particular thing nobody's tracking you they're just looking at right now are you okay right okay? and that's what i think we should be focused on the vaccine piece cannot be done by state by state by state, state, by state. it's got to be a federal effort and it, just, it has to be and i think that's also why people are um are, are worried because we don't have, we've lost the faith that we need. Yeah, I, I, think, I think this is a broader conversation around the importance of policy, right? It, and I think government policy matters. We see it in times of crisis. This is a great example where the gap in policy is so evident in terms of not just leadership, not just moral leadership in right. terms of the back and forth with the American public on uh, signaling, symbol, symbol, symbolic signaling, which is all negative and not positive, but on leadership on some of these issues, laying out there the framework for a discussion is completely missing. And the federal government has to be the essential actor. You know, I feel like Massachusetts government has done what they can, mm -hmm. done a great job, and even, even some of the early actions around flu vaccine, right? Yeah. which is controversial, but making it a requirement for re-entry into schools and having folks um, show that their kids have had the flu vaccine is really important. But without the overarching governmental, federal governmental um, structure on things like the vaccine, uh, I feel like we're going to struggle uh, over time without that kind of protocol. Absolutely. I agree. Uh, Gary, what kind of questions are you getting from Governor Baker and from others now about the state of affairs in terms of healthcare claims, what insurance companies are experiencing, what providers are experiencing through the claims that you know, we're processing? And what does it show you? What, what, what does the data show you? Sort of let's do a September status report on the market. Sure, yeah. So I would, I mean, first, I think the center has articulated um, some of our biggest challenges, and I, I won't, I, I won't be able to reiterate what she said, but it is, um, I think she spoke to the interconnectivity of all of this, from healthcare to schools, uh, to daycare. Uh, it's just so much of this is is intertwined, and the decisions that we make on one side impact another, and so we have to be so mindful of that. Um, as as to your question, Mike, it is. And I think the center also spoke to just how challenging all these things are because we're not sure what the best answer is. Um, and <clears throat> you're going through this for the, you know, for the first time. And that is some of our challenges on the ground, like real time, um, because much of what we do is, you know, policy implementation. Um, so a technical arm, I guess, is, is uh, one way to describe us. And part of that is, um, you know, there are a couple of, things that I would note on your question, Mike, is one that it's claims like utilization, that stuff tends to usually drag because the, right, it's usually a few months um, before you see a run out of kind of reliable data on, on, on utilization and claims. So it takes a little bit of time to really uh, make decisions on good data. But we're one area that you see, which 
isn't, knock on wood, is encouraging, and the senator spoke to this, she's right, I mean, there's such a large part of the market that we don't oversee the division, but that is overseen federally, which is because that's ERISA, it's employer-sponsored healthcare, right? And um, thus far, knock on wood, right, we've seen, uh, we were really concerned about the dip in, in membership data, right, and levels of membership, and losing people from uh, being insured. Um, we've seen, uh, I, I want to say it's maybe 40,000 or so across, you know, that's the merge market, which is the, the single individual and the small group, the large group market, um, self-employed that have lost, right, 40,000 that have lost, which is, you know, in relative numbers, that's, that's a very good sign. We were very concerned that it was going to be much, much larger than that. I think there has been a concerted effort to, you know, as everyone has said about from the carriers, right? We early on, I want to say in March again, spoke with carriers and directed the, um, the carriers to do everything possible. And this spanned all lines of insurance, right? Do everything possible to make sure that policyholders keep their coverage, right? That means grace periods, um, if possible payment plans. Um, and you know, a number of employers uh, have made, you know, while furloughed people may have kept them on, right? This is what we address in some of our bulletins. If you're furloughing them, keep them on your, uh, your health plan. Um, so I, I'd, I'd like to think that a number of the efforts by a lot of people have kept that steady. So that's the, the current state, Mike, is that it's um, <clears throat> encouraging on the numbers, on the, on the membership numbers. Um, claims data, we obviously saw a dip in utilization, um, you know, after, you know, starting in probably really saw it in May, June, um, April, May, June, where there was a big dip in utilization that started to get back closer to pre-COVID. And you combine that with telehealth services, which, like you said, has filled a gap, not, not fully, but has help to fill some gap. Um, I think one of our biggest challenges is for those that may be unaware, and I, I sometimes I hesitate to talk about it because it bores people, but it's the responsibility the Division of Insurance has to review the rates, right? The submitted rate requests by the insurance companies for, you know, for quarter one, 2021, right? So if we're, thinking about all, everything that we've discussed and kind of the uncertainty around everything and vaccines and different types of tests that are effective or not effective. Uh, what does a vaccine look like? How much does it cost? Um, trying to build that <laughs> into your rates for 2021 is really a challenge. And I, I would say, when um, there's part of me that that's, feels fortunate because at the division of insurance, um, I'm not on the rate review side because ultimately if there's a, if we disapprove some rates, uh, uh, an insurance company can challenge that um, and it goes through a hearing process. It becomes very market disruptive, but it is a hearing process here at the DOI overseen by a hearing officer that makes a recommendation to me on whether to agree or disagree with the, the disapproval for, of those, you know, uh, our deputy that oversees the, the rate review. Um, and the way that works is that, you know, we, we, we engage outside actuaries every quarter uh, who challenge um, the rate, assess, you know, the actuarial assessments within the, the rate submissions. Um, we push back on carriers, right? This is, Mike is intimately engaged in this process and knows the challenge every single quarter. The deputy that oversees that and the actuarial work made a comment on the last week of that process that it was the most difficult in his 26 years. Um, because we just, there are so many uncertainties and the challenge back and forth with, you know, um, I think the carriers uh, pushed him to a bit of a brink. And there were a couple of carriers where we debated um, whether to disapprove at this point. And I think in the end, you know, part of that is rates need to be on file at the, the connector um, in, a, in a certain time frame, and those rates wouldn't have been on file, which means people's coverage may have been disrupted uh, or switched to other plans. So 
there's, um, it was a really, really difficult challenge, I think, for us. Um, and one going into the second quarter of 2021 um, will be equally challenging because of, in light of just the uncertainties. What, what do you make of the statement that uh, the market hasn't completely shaken out yet in terms of financial implications for, for example, providers? You know, we, we, you know one of the issues that I, we wanted to raise today was uh, making sure that our provider community, hospitals and doctor groups alike and others, survive the pandemic and are able to provide care across a wide swath of geography for Massachusetts. And we're fortunate that we have um, some of the best healthcare in America, in the world, being provided right here in the Commonwealth. But there have been, at certain times along the way, challenges financially for some institutions. And yet, I think this, the situation is different, Ch changes month to month, right? I guess is the way I would say it. We're not in the same position that we were in in April where folks were not getting care. But what what is, maybe I'll ask Cindy this, you check in with the, the players a lot. Uh, what are you hearing in terms of financial stability, the challenges, and maybe the impact of federal government's role in this area? Well, I'm still hearing a lot of um, concern around the sort of individual provider networks. Um, and um, I don't, I don't, I haven't seen a lot of, I mean, I know lots more people are coming online, but there's still big issues around individual provider groups. Um, the hospitals, um, which are the other really big players, we did a lot um, of work in the government, actually the state did a lot of work in the beginning with I think a $1.6 billion payout um, to hospitals, which was hugely valuable. We, we uh, increased rates, um, uh, some of the, the, we increased the Medicaid rates. Um, and then the CARES Act came in and some of that bundled hospital money has, uh, uh, money separate from the CARES Act, which was directly to hospitals. And I think there were three tranches so I think that's really helped people and certainly helped people stay kind of in the game, right? Um, it's the, but the worry is what's going to happen if, what, first of all, when the, um, when the emergency orders are lifted, do the rates go back? Um, and then what's going to happen as we move forward um, in terms of um, keeping the hospitals, you know, um, whole or keeping them at least running. So I think that that issue is still there. It's just right now, some of the, um, some, there's been some breathing room and that that's yeah. been good. So it's given us time to I think yeah. look at I can, it. I can say that's our sense too, just from what we have heard all along. Um, and we've been in touch frequently. You know, right. we, we want to make sure that we continue to have a lot of access to providers in our network and folks aren't shy, uh, you know, in terms of reaching out to me, you, Mary Lou Sutters, uh, you know, when, when there is a concern. And I just get the sense that um, the way you put it is accurate. It's not gone by any means, but there's a little bit of a, a uh, just a bit of breathing room to sort of get through. And folks are also waiting to see how I think we confirm resolution on some really important policy aspects around telehealth, right? Yeah, that's the biggest one. I mean, I just hear about that and I hear a certain amount of scope of practice too, but yeah. it's like, are you gonna take telehealth away from us? So maybe you could tell people what the Senate, some of the scope of practice improvements are that you hope to uh, push through uh, by the end of the year. Well, what, what I would hope to be able to do um, is certainly to have all of the advanced practice nurses working to the height of their, uh, to the top of their license. So that's the um, registered nurses, the nurse practitioners, the um, uh, um, uh, CRNAs that um, uh, anesthesiology and the advanced practice um, uh, psychiatric nurses, which are very dear, near and dear to my heart. But I think what we've seen is that through the pandemic that that is a, a good 
right thing to do is to make sure all of those people, and it's especially important around in community hospitals and, um, and community health centers and having this workforce this in, very, a, in, in terms of access to care, right? In so, terms of access to care, right? Very experienced, very knowledgeable, and I think we. So I, I think I, I think we really need to. I, I would hope that that would be addressed. Um, you know, I think there's some other pieces that I think are important. You know, the uh, especially again, like for health centers, optometrists being able to give glucose um, uh, uh, drops. Um, so there, there are, and I would like to see us keep some of the, certainly keep the scope of practice in place that we opened up during the pandemic, which is a, a series of the nurses, and making sure that we're doing a scope of practice that especially addresses behavioral health. That anything we can do to expand behavioral health, and I think there's other things we can do, but we want to make sure that we... Um, that we keep those pieces, the, the, those um, scope of practice increases in place. So I think that's what I would like to see. So we're close to the time when I think we were gonna start to integrate some questions, Lizzie, but I, I want your advice as to whether we should continue. I've, I've got a few other panel discussion topics, but uh, how much time do you want me to save? So we have three questions and I think you have a few more minutes that you could keep going. Perfect. Uh, thanks for that time check. I do want to turn a little bit towards the, the future in terms of state policy guys uh, and um, processing and maybe start uh, with you, Gary. Are there lessons learned that you think we've picked up from the pandemic in terms of process that you could see us continuing longer term um, with the stakeholders and, and the community that the DOI integrates with. Um, you know, I think we, we've had a challenging time period as a group and whether it's back to back to back Zoom calls, Zoom fatigue, which hopefully the people on this call will not be experiencing, um, but Zoom fatigue is a real thing. But I think it's also been a great fabricing of the community in terms of your work and Deputy Commissioner Began's work in terms of the group. Are there lessons learned that you'd like us to continue as a healthcare community past the pandemic? Sure, yeah, and I think I would be remiss if I didn't highlight just one of the success that, that the market has experienced from telehealth. So um, I know the Senator <clears throat> has worked hard uh, and I appreciated her outreach to us and getting our thoughts on uh, as they considered policy approaches for how to to maintain the practice, um, <clears throat> that will be critical um, to <clears throat> to making sure that that continues in place. And and we'll continue to work with um, <clears throat> her and the rest of the administration to make sure that that, that does happen. Um, I, and I think on the more practical side, um, you know, we were required <clears throat> as part of administration practice to take some courses about leading at a distance um, and real practical day-to-day um, -day things. Um, and one thing that, that struck me was um, to continue this type of practice. I mean, I envisioned that we we're gonna be in this format for quite a while. I suspect that people at the Division of Insurance will be working from home remotely for, for the foreseeable future. Um, and this, this format uh, platform, I do think provides a connection that we don't otherwise get um, you know, via the telephone um, <clears throat> or email. So I, you know, I've tried recently to make, to, to institute it with, you know, during our senior staff meetings and while I am no IT expert <laughs> um, and it, one of those trainings said, do the things that you're uncomfortable doing. So I said, well, that is that. So I will, um, <laughs> you know, I've been a part of these Zooms or WebEx or Teams, you know, dozens and dozens of times, but never at my own urging, right? It was because I was, a, you know, a part of the panel or I was, you know, through our National Association of Insurance Commissioners on meetings, coordinating across the states, but never, you know, something that I had instituted. So while, um, you know, it's not, it's not the big, you know, grand policy approach, I do think it's important um, to stay connected to each other like this. And 
while we may be getting it may be getting old i i hope that we um continue the practice because it, I, I find it really valuable cindy a, a little bit of a twist on the question could you talk a little bit for folks on the phone about the challenges of a deliberative body like the senate uh, interacting virtually <laughs> and, and how you came to terms with that as a body because I think the Senate president and your teams have done a great job of getting there um, but it wasn't intuitive and so take us along that that um, journey which now looks really uh, smooth but I'm sure it was pretty rocky in that March April time frame um, sure um... You know, I think we've done an extraordinary job um, doing business in these conditions. And I think um, I give just an enormous amount of credit to the Senate president who um, has just been an incredible leader during this time in, in the big issues and the little issues about, you know, getting computers to people and figuring out how to do Zoom and, you know, so I think we've been another, is another example in the Commonwealth of which there are many of what leadership means. So, um, but I have to tell you, it's tough in a deliberative body. Um, we really can't underestimate the effects of just human contact, of walking down the hall and seeing you or being in at an event with you, Gary, right? It's just, it's where you just talk to people. Yeah. And learn, right? And, and learn yeah. and have a different uh, venue to, you know, just kind of even just to get to know each other so Absolutely. that you can continue to have conversations. And it really goes back to my earlier comment about how important relationships are and how they, they that importance just, it, it's just, it grows exponentially when you have this kind of situation. If I didn't know you guys, it's kind of hard to start a conversation or start a, a, a kind of just a basis of trust, right? Yeah. So I think, um, I think it's for a deliberative body where so much of it is just talking with each yeah. other and then saying, hey, you know, maybe there is common ground or yeah, well, I can get what you say or I, I notice that you're upset, right? Right. That right. you kind of get the, that human feedback. It's tough. Con context, context clues are so important. They're so important. And our lives that we don't even realize it. You know, yeah, mask on. Yeah. I mean, you can't, you know. So I think it's, we've done absolutely the best we can, and it is not optimal. Um, right. And, but, you know, we're going to make it work. And we will continue yep. to make it work. But well, I can I can tell you as an outsider, you know, who watches deliberative bodies very closely, you've done a great job. And and I know that the setting up of those structures was not easy. No. In the processing of a bill. Right. You know, you Especially a on a bill. Right. I do want to answer your question though about the two um, the lessons learned. Please. I have a short lesson and a long one. Yes. The short one is, is that I think what we've learned is that our hospitals are really good at ramping up when they have to. And so I think it's really important that we don't make them um, kind of hunker down for longer periods than they have to. So, you know, they, they came up to speed in a, literally two weeks, right? To get everybody out of the hospital, to get, you know, just the ICU set up. And so I think we should when we do regulations and requirements for them, I think we need to keep that in mind. Yep. Um, the second thing I wanna say, because and, and Mike, you know this is one of my favorite subjects, is that we got rid of a, a certain amount of administrative detail, administrative requirements on providers. And I think we should look really hard at what we put back because we know that that is one of the biggest issues that we hear from providers all the time is at the administrivia. And so anything we can do that we've learned that said, you know what, we'll need to make people do that anymore. I think yeah, it, it, it's interesting that you bring that up because Blue Cross has integrated with some of our providers mm -hmm. and partners is one of the groups or Mass General Brigham uh, as they're called 
in terms of our virtual sharing of information automatically through the electronic medical record. So there is no formal prior off process uh, to speak of. Yeah. It happens naturally through the clinician information that's already in the record. And it's been a wild success. It, it's, uh, it, it took six months or a little longer to integrate towards that project. But it goes to your point, Cindy, of the value add can still happen, right? There's still value there that we'll want to sure. elicit in terms of care management, working together with a provider. It shouldn't be just a default to the provider. But let's think through ways to do it that don't add resources to the right. provider burden, but actually can be more accessible to them. And we at Blue Cross are hoping to, and I'll just do one quick aside, hoping to do that across the board over time so that it's, it's an automatic system because your point is really well taken. You know, let's get people to things that are really important and stay away from the things that aren't important. Sometimes that care management will be important, but a lot of times it won't be. And so how do we root, root into that question again and working with stakeholders to get at that answer, I think will be really important. So I do know. I, I just say something. Oh, I'm sorry, Gary. Yeah, I, I, um, I think again, much like telehealth, and it's this pilot of, of ideas. I think the center makes a very good point. Um, when you know we've issued what two or three bulletins right on this very topic about uh, care management, right? Prior authorization, administrative flexibilities, um, and how I mean, with the idea that we've got to get you know, people in and out of the hospital so that hospitals are free to care for the, patient, the patients that need care right now, right? If they're particularly COVID related. Uh, and that happened really fast, uh, like, she, like the Senator said, with regard to how the hospitals were able to um, quickly do that. I think the carriers as well had to be very flexible. And, um, and so maybe, maybe the underlying goal then is, right? Because so many of these pieces are put in place with the idea of cost containment. And sometimes the insurance company can be the bad guy because they're saying no, um, but it's been such an important piece from 2006 to 2012, 10, 12, um, about how do we contain costs, right? And so where's the backstop? And if that backstop, whether it's an administrative function here or there, is not serving that overall purpose of cost containment, right? Then what? Then maybe it's something we need to to do away with. And so I, I, I appreciate that to the carriers because there a lot has been placed on the carrier to be that backstop to, to serve the cost containment function. So that, um, but that there it's given an opportunity even while there is a flurry of things going on and hospitals and carriers, everyone is being pulled in a number of directions that there's still that assessment of whether it serves its true function or not. Um, so I, and I, and I think, that, you know, we, as you said, Sorry, Mike, but Commissioner, Deputy Commissioner Began has instituted calls that happen, I think it's every two weeks, right, with carriers and providers that has, have provided a forum for these types of discussions. That, I think, to the center's point, is something I think, I think, pardon me, should probably continue so we can sort through, right, what are you seeing right now and how yep. can it reasonably be addressed? Thanks. Yep. That's great. And I guess, I guess I'll just end by saying, um, that each situation is slightly different. There, there's some situations where that value is still there and others where there's no need. And I think that's the lens that we should be answering that question and has already been brought in. Uh, so I know I see some questions are, are ready and I think um, Lissy has agreed to serve as moderator for those questions. So I'll turn it over to, to you, Lissy. Thank you, and thank you, everyone. I'll start with, we have two questions from Dr. Lachlan Faro. Please forgive me if I've mispronounced your name. If you would like to ask your questions aloud, I can figure out how to make that happen, or you can tell me if you'd like to have me read them. Maybe I can't do this. Um, I'm not sure. So I think I will have to ask it. So the first question is re-telehealth. It would right. not be hard to- Is, is it working now? Oh, yes. Dr. 
borrow. I see your hi. Name. Hi. So, not, yeah. So, so I mean, the questions. I, I, first question. Um, loved what you guys are saying about telehealth. Um, uh, uh, my focus for a lot of my life, I, I've been involved in palliative care in the field. I chair the DPH State Advisory Council on Palliative Care, chaired an expert panel years ago. Um, and uh, uh, two things that I think should never happen in the future, this happened almost every day, are, are two reasons why people from nursing facilities, often frail elders with dementia, um, uh, are brought to emergency departments for things that could have been taken care of in their facility. And if what I said in my question was, um, it's technically easy um, that if every facility had the right telehealth equipment and you had a cadre of doctors like me and others, we could pilot it with some volunteers, honestly. Um, I bet that we could prove that for lots of things that happen in nursing facilities, that the patients with nursing staff there, if they had access to me or other doctors in real time, would never need to leave the nursing facility, would have better care at lower cost, except nobody has financial incentive to set up the system. And so we're stuck without the system. I, I'll jump in and just say, I, I agree. And I think our, our disconnection, particularly around senior care, is a, a real failure, not just in Massachusetts, but across the country. But Massachusetts in, in particular has some real gaps there. I don't have an easy solution other than the fact that, you know, Blue Cross uh, pledges to continue to work towards piloting some of these ideas, Dr. Faro. And I, I, I do think that um, what you say makes a lot of sense. It, it, you know, it's similar, it's sort of an offshoot to this whole concept of mobile integrated healthcare and making sure that on the ambulatory side, uh, folks are seen in their homes, even for emergency visits, so they don't have to go into the emergency room. It would be extending that principle into the nursing home setting, and I think it makes complete sense. Uh, exactly, that'll be a great segue into what I think is gonna be your third question from someone else, not me. Right. Um, the, um, the, the second question, I had a totally different topic. Um, uh, just in the last 10 days uh, with colleagues in uh, Harvard uh, Center for Bioethics, Tuskegee, Rockefeller Foundation, and then even some work working with Dan Baruch, who's leading the vaccine effort with B.I. Deaconess. Um, we need to get the science right for the vaccine and all the politics that's in the headlines. But there are severe concerns from people who really know that there is such distrust in African-American communities and other vulnerable communities that even if we have the science right, there's gonna be a lot of hesitation about getting the vaccine among the most vulnerable populations. And one national expert yesterday who's, promote, who's involved in the vaccine said they were scared that herd immunity could be delayed for months if these communities have not uh, uh, been reached out to and actually we've earned their trust. And if herd immunity is delayed for months, then not only is Senator Friedman going to be wearing a mask or, or a part, kids are not going to be in school, economic problems. Um, and that I, I, I've suddenly become convinced, convinced in the last week that should be like near the top of everybody's agenda because every single person in the Commonwealth in this country shares an interest in getting closer to herd immunity, which requires that the most vulnerable people are actually not just offered the vaccine, but get it. It's been on my mind a lot, and I'm glad that you brought it up because there's there's a primary government role there. It should, frankly, be a federal government role in the first instance, but let's forget about that, at least for the time being, um, because that's not going to happen. But once the science is right, there needs to be specific outreach at a level that we have not seen in this state for some time. Governor Patrick, when he was the governor, um, had a public event around his H1N1 inoculation. That should be one tool as an example among many. And we should have a multi-million dollar um, outreach campaign that can be funded through a variety of stakeholders to get there. But you are exactly right. We have to dispel the myth we have to get in front of that issue in working, and, and I believe, frankly, that we will be addressing this. I don't think this is going to be something that gets forgotten, at least here in Massachusetts, but the stakeholders will need to bind together to address that issue for a broad-based campaign, first of all, 
but then specific targeted campaigns relative to underserved populations has to be part of an essential outreach campaign. I completely agree, and I'm really glad you brought it up. And let me just add, I'd, I'd love to hear from Senator Friedman. Can I just add one framing for Senator Friedman? Just, um, this is not, this can't wait for the vaccine because it's all about earning the trust of people in those communities. So a leader in Atlanta says, we're doing all this testing outreach. The communities want testing. We're trying to get to that for them. But actually the real payoff is when they get to know us and we've earned their trust because what they care about, then they'll listen to us about vaccines. Sorry, Senator Friedman. So that's starting now. There is a group that I am actually going to be part of because um, I just got put on it that is looking at these issues and and the major issue is um, right now is around trust. I want to point something out. We have so dismantled our public health system in Massachusetts over the course of the last 20 or 25 or whatever years that it, it, it's, it fundamentally doesn't exist in places where it's really, really important that it exists. Having strong local public health in communities is really critical to helping that community come to trust what is being delivered in the, in the area of public health. And that's something that we absolutely have got to rebuild and we have to do it now. And there are some really good, smart people who are working on this issue. Because we know, we know if you have that trust and it's gotta be at the community level, it's gotta be among people that at least somebody knows, right? Um, and that's that you can be accountable to people in that community. That we need to rebuild that and we have to do it quickly. It's absolutely critical, not just for this, but for all manner of um, health issues that are going to come before us going forward. So, cosign um, to that, absolutely. So, I think that's that is, there is there's great effort and um, urgency to do that, and I certainly uh, applaud it and want to be part of it. Completely agree. Can can I go on to an, the next question? We've spoken a fair amount about behavioral health. This is from an anonymous attendee. Thank you all for the hard and good work you did to manage the changes that COVID-19 brought. Given the increased demand for mental behavioral health treatments, are there any legislative or insurer plans or joint initiatives to expand access to medical care specifically for mental health? Are there any plans to increase research and state funding? Is there a prior, is this a priority given that COVID-19 and isolation has caused a spike in need. So I'll, I'll turn it over to the Senator shortly. I will just start by saying that Blue Cross announced uh, a seven point plan, uh, six and a half really, <laughs> point plan about uh, two months ago around behavioral health improvements that included significantly uh, a cost payment equity within office visits which we think is gonna be a huge boon to the behavioral health provider community to make sure that consumers get access to the care that they need. We still have gaps in care delivery geographically that we want to work on. Cape Cod and, and uh, Western Mass, for example, have issues with regard to child psychiatry being uh, available. Um, but with the COVID-19 um, influence spike in cases, I think it's more important now than ever that we not only take that private leadership, but then also enact the reforms that the Senator, um, I'm sure, will be talking about. Um, yes. Um, so there's several things legislatively that we've done and that we will continue that we were working on. In terms of telehealth, I think um, there's rate parity is a very, you know, touchy issue, gentlemen, part of the panel. But I think we all agree that behavioral health has been something that has absolutely worked um, and will continue to work on pretty much every level. I mean, there's a few, like I mentioned, but we, I think legislatively, we want, we're interested in ensuring that that rate <clears throat> parity continue. So that's one thing. Um, we have, the Senate has done, a, uh, I, I think, a very good bill that includes um, 
uh, that includes parity and takes parity further um, in terms of ensuring that how we're measuring um, what the law of the land is, which is that behavioral health be treated in the same manner that a physical um, surgical health is, to make sure that we are following those rules and that we're getting the data that we need and information we need, and in fact, that is true. Um, we do have to do something about rates, and I, 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 and I really applaud Blue Cross Blue Shield for coming out um, um, with their plan. I think this is just really important. It's just been the stepchild for a long time. And now we, again, another lesson learned that we probably knew, but we got smacked upside the head with it, is how important access to behavioral health care is. So um, we've got the parity bill, we've got, um, we have looking at telehealth and ensuring that that stay um, connected. Um, we've done a lot of work on provider networks. So provider networks are those networks that the insurers have um, for getting coverage, getting treatment for things that you have a benefit that's part of your benefit plan. We've done a lot of work both, uh, you know, in conjunction with the providers, uh, I mean, in, with the carriers on ensuring that those provider networks are, um, uh, are robust enough. And you know, we do have real issues around children's mental health. Um, but, you know, we're going to keep working on that. I think that's both a legislative and a regulation and an insurer, you know, carrier issue. And I think we've got some good um, connectivity among the, the stakeholder group. Um, so I think those are things that, you know, we have to keep pushing on rates, uh, access. We also have to, though, bring some of these providers back into the networks, okay? I really understand that when it's so difficult administratively and to, to, you know, to meet the requirements as a provider to provide um, care, I understand that. And when the rates are so low, you just have a perfect storm and people are saying, I don't, I don't wanna be part of this network. It's, it's just not worth it to me. I'm making $5 an hour by the time I get done. I get that and we really need to address it and I think we are. But as we address that, we gotta get more providers to come back in to say, you know what, we're solving this problem, but now you need to be part of the, net, the networks. And it's especially true around psychiatrists. And, um, and maybe we, you know, we, we, start, we need to look at that. We need to start to say, we know what we need to do and they're absolutely right. What do you need to do because we need all hands on deck. We need all hands on deck to solve this problem and to get people care. And we can't do it alone. We need the providers with us, so. Yeah, Mike, I would say, um, or let's say, uh, just to add to what the Senator said, um, I, I echo much of what she said, um, but the, the last part about, um, my hope is that through this, right, that that does encourage uh, the re-entrance of a number of these providers um, and with efforts like Blue Cross has undertaken um, recently um, and what they've come out with and what we've seen in the market just generally about pay structures and um, hopefully that will uh, encourage uh, providers to, to come back as you said and there are a number of things you, you mentioned kind of, um, provider directories which um, we at the DOI Right, through a task force, we've been working to make sure that those that the the behavioral health component of that provider directory is uh, meets the standard that it should meet. Um, that uh, we've extended, you know, with work with the carriers, care behavioral health care to to children and adolescents, uh, which have um, you know, in a sense, mirrored what um, uh, Mass Health had been uh, covering. Um, you know, ED boarding, right? Emergency department boarding, getting people out of those with behavioral health challenges out of emergency departments. So all of those, I'd say those pieces have continued to work has continued to go on even during the pandemic. I think we're getting better at them closer to where we should be. Um, so just a few that I would highlight there, let's see. Thanks. I have three questions left. This one is from Paul Lanzikos. Again, apologies if I mispronounce your name. Returning to the issue of nursing homes. On a per capita client basis, nursing home residents eligible for mass health coverage are the most expensive 
consumers in the system and the least satisfied with quality of life and care. Facility-based care system has remained essentially unchanged for over 50 years. How can nursing homes be reimagined, especially in light of the vulnerability due to the spread of infectious diseases such as COVID-19 and what could be the upcoming annual flu season? I can answer a little bit of that. So um, again, another glaring um, gap that we've seen is um, in nursing homes and um, just care in general for um, uh, seniors. So uh, I do know that there is a, um, a very um, uh, concentrated effort on um, taking what, so uh, let me just back up for a second. So as part of COVID, the administration put in a number of, um, not only a large amount of money, uh, raised the rates and, and gave of dollars, but also put in some regulations for nursing homes. That is gonna continue. There was a nursing home study done, I don't know, three years ago, perhaps, and they've gone back to that and they are starting to implement and, and figure out how to implement those, um, the changes from the nursing home task force, which was a, 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 a very good study. So uh, the administration I'm sh I know is working on um, upgrading a number of uh, requirements and um, practices in nursing homes and it, they will do it as a um, requirement for additional dollars for nursing homes. So there's a, there's a, a stick and a carrot being attached to that. And um, you know, one of the things that I think people are looking very, very um, uh, carefully at is all of the um, uh, regulations that were put in place, but that many of the nursing homes were grandfathered so that they were they didn't have to meet those new requirements for nursing homes coming on um, online. And now I think they're gonna go back and say, everybody's gotta come up to sort of the latest standards. So it's, it's, it's a very complicated problem. It's um, a not easy one. It's, you are right, the questioner is absolutely right. It is very expensive and the care is, is really not um, kind of up to where it needs to be but it's, it's changing the mindset of nursing homes and what they do and how they do it. And that has, that has been ongoing. And I, I hope, hope we will see some real changes um, moving forward. Thank you, Senator. Commissioner, does the Insurance Commission have any responsibility or jurisdiction over concerns of frail elders who are, quote, insured by senior care organizations such as Common Health, Common Health Care Alliance, whereas the premiums are paid by Mass Health. Uh, I guess in short, I, no. Um, I mean, if the, I guess the answer would be if, if Commonwealth Care Alliance, I think that's who you're referring to. I don't think they're licensed by the Division of Insurance. So if they're not a licensed entity, we wouldn't necessarily have oversight. So if it's a Mass Health reimbursement, right, it would fall under um, the the auspices of mass health. Okay, thank you. The last question disappeared, but it was, is there anything that you think municipalities should be doing right now or in the immediate future with regard to COVID-19 and the government response? I, I'll, I'll start just by saying, and Blue Cross is proud that we represent so many towns and cities across the Commonwealth that I think the biggest impact on towns and cities are going to be fiscal impacts. And so far, towns and cities have been largely protected on their budgets, but that the federal government's role in terms of providing state budget support is really important in this next month or so. And, and um, hopefully we'll have Congress pass a financial aid package that will end up going to benefit towns and cities across Massachusetts uh, by and through the state budget. Because if they do not, we're gonna see un unemployment levels increase over the fall, not just in the municipal market, but in the commercial market as well. That will not be a good thing for the state. It won't be a good thing for care delivery. 
and it won't be a good thing for Mass Health's uh, own budget going up in terms of cost. And that financial aid package is something I wanted to mention before we closed, is essentially critically important for towns and cities across the board. Then when we get to the um, public health aspects, I'm pretty proud of the job that towns and cities have done across this state in terms of interaction with the command center and with the Department of Public Health. I guess, you know, continuing that work, particularly around contact tracing, is going to be really important. Um, as we have outbreaks and clusters, those local public health departments really have a lot of pressure to, to react to those uh, concerns, but I, I'd give them a solid A during this whole process. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree. And again, though, I go back to, you know, in some cities and towns, it's working really, really well. In other cities and towns, it's not working well at all, especially in Western Mass, where you have one, one public health official who's got 50 communities that they are responsible for. Well, you can't, you can't, that, that it's not their fault. Um, so we really, really, I think if we want to support cities and towns and have expectations of them to do, um, you know, to be the public health um, leaders, we have to give them the tools and the, and the processes and the support that they need to do that. And so I think that's, a, that's the state responsibility. And, um, and hopefully we won't forget um, soon how important public health is, because it's critical. I think we are out of time. It's 1.31. I want to say thank you so much to all three of you, Commissioner Anderson, Senator Friedman, Mike Caljo. You have really answered many questions. You have been provocative enough to suggest other questions that we will continue to ask in this challenging time of our lives. And I also want to thank Cindy Wynn from the Rappaport Center and Stephanie Pinion and Dave Swanson from the Commissioner and Senator's offices, respectively. Everybody came together to plan this over the summer and then to be willing to regroup for this fall for today. So thank you so much, everybody. Last words from any of you? And just thank you very much for for having us, I thought it was a great session. And I do, I guess I just note that we are different here in Massachusetts. This level of collaboration is something that a lot of states do not have. And uh, I hope it comes across even in today's conversation. Yeah, thank you. I wanna thank you to the Rappaport Center um, for this and for all of your um, public service and uh, that it's great to have partners like um, Mike and Gary. Thank you, sir. Yeah. And thank you, yeah, thank you, Leslie, um, and to you, to Cindy, to the Rapport Center, um, and to Mike um, for, for asking the center and I to, to be uh, involved with this. I, you're right, Mike, we're fortunate in Massachusetts that we're different. Um, and we've certainly found that through this that um, we really only find um, good solutions when we do it uh, together. So uh, as challenging as that can be sometimes, because we don't always agree on approaches, but I think we, we have a, say, a shared goal to serve uh, folks in the Commonwealth. So we're fortunate that, uh, that we see that. So thank you. Well, thank you all. Stay well, everybody. Thank you.